what I have been told uh, pr pr uh, prior to this meeting is that each of you are interested in some type of a career in healthcare, and whether that be in psychology or nursing or in medicine, uh, it's going to be some career where you're going to stand before a person, a patient in a professional capacity, and as part of that calling, as part of that professional relationship, you're going to be asked to give advice. And I'm here to tell you uh, that giving advice can be, can be very difficult. I have been asked to give you some advice today. And I'm not sure what I can tell you that would have meaning or relevance uh, for your life today. Um, in a doctor's office, one would think that advice is easily uh, given and uh, readily received, but that's not really true. Uh, somebody that's in pain with a broken rib or a broken wrist is going to listen. But if you start to uh, engage somebody in a theoretical discussion as to why they should stop smoking or take better care of himself, uh, that's actually a much harder sell. And the reason for that is that we all go through life with a blind spot. And this blind spot, which is a form of self-delusion, basically says that this cannot happen to me, that somehow I'm protected uh, uh, and that whatever you're really talking about is not going to happen to me. And that also happens with students. Uh, I, I know you're sitting out there saying, what could this man possibly say to me that's going to be of help uh, or have meaning and relevance uh, to my life? Now, I, as I look out at all of you, I, of course, see myself in my youth. Actually, you guys look a little better than I did. <laughs> Pictures from that period of my life would show a very skinny kid with long hair and a gaunt, hollow look in his eyes. You guys remember who Charles Manson is? Picture that. I looked a little possessed, almost haunted. If I was in school today, I would be referred for professional counseling, <laughs> maybe put on medication. That gaunt, haunted, semi-demonic look came from an overwhelming desire uh, to change my circumstance in life. Newsflash, I did not become a doctor to help my fellow man at first. I became a doctor for a very simple reason. I wanted to escape poverty. Now, it wasn't a grinding, not enough to eat, not a roof over your head kind of poverty, but it was more of an emotional impoverishment. And I wanted to escape what I thought was the daily hum humdrum and boredom of my parents' lives. I grew up in a perfectly nice home. I don't want there to be any misunderstanding. Ma, please forgive me, OK? <laughs> My parents loved me. They gave me birthday presents and Christmas presents. But I have to say that at a young age, life seemed a little flat, if not boring. I remember looking down, up and down the row of attached houses where I grew up in Queens and thinking that there had to be more to life. And again, I just want to emphasize, because I feel a little guilty, uh, it's not because it was bad. It just seemed a little dull. And I didn't want to escape to something that was greener or nicer or more suburban. In fact, I went the other direction. I wanted something grittier and maybe dirtier, uh, but to me it seemed uh, uh, something that would be more real. So I left a public New York City high school. I turned down a scholarship to Princeton University, and I went to City College in New York. I lived on 144th Street and Amsterdam Avenue, above a bodega and right next to the bongo player. <laughs> I learned Spanglish. I learned to love Cuban Chinese cuisine. I walked the streets all hours of the day and night, perfecting that wild-eyed stare that makes people think you're a little off and keeps them away. If I sat next to you on the subway, you might change your seat. <laughs> I had a relentless, blinding curiosity. Funny, 
because curiosity is supposed to open one's eyes. But my curiosity was so intense that it blinded me, and it got me into trouble at times. Like when I asked the pretty Dominican girl at a street fair to dance, not, reali not realizing that she was with the guy covered in tattoos. I didn't realize it at the time, but I was taking a page from the work of Henry David Thoreau, and he wrote, I wanted to live deep and suck out all the marrow of life, to live so sturdily and Spartan-like as to put to rout all that was not life, to drive life into a corner, and to reduce it to its lowest terms. I was doing the urban version of this. Now, where did this blinding, almost maniacal curiosity come from? I'm not really sure. Probably looking back from my father, here's my theory. He loved the open road. The man loved to drive. The family vacation every August was a road trip. The last week in July, my father and I would travel into New York City, into Manhattan, and we'd go to the old Mobile Oil headquarters. They had a free map service. You never met my father, but the word free was very important. You'd tell them where you'd want to go, and they would trace out your journey on these old paper maps, these old road maps. We'd take a number and wait our turn. I'd turn to him, I'd say, Dad, where are we going? He'd say, I'm not really sure. I'd say, what do you mean you're not sure? They're, they're going to call us in in a couple of minutes. He says, I'm still thinking about it. They would call us in, and the man would ask, where would you like to go? And I swear to you, until the words came out of my father's mouth, he didn't know, and I didn't know. Then he'd say, Portland, Oregon. I want to go to Portland, Oregon. One year he said Newfoundland. One year he said Tijuana, Mexico. It was always someplace different. We'd get our maps, pack our bags, and we'd leave a week later. We traveled for one month. No reservations. The destination was known, but it was the journey that was most important. Two points. I'm going to give you the points. I'm not going to save them for the end. I'm going to intersperse them. Now is the time in your life to be curious. Ask questions. Open your eyes. Look and see at what's around you. Take an interest in how other people live. Next, put yourself in your family narrative. Look into your family tree and try to see where you fit. Pick some of your better family qualities. Maybe it's a flair for fashion, or a musical talent, or the strength of Hercules. Maybe it's a crazy love for driving. You don't have to necessarily rival your uncle's belching abilities. <laughs> Take a quality from both your mother and father's side of the aisle. Blend them together and make them your own. I climbed Mount Kilimanjaro 10 years ago. I hated every minute of it. <laughs> it's, a, it's a vacation or a trip I wouldn't wish on my worst enemy. I've never seen so much mud. I wanted to quit on the final ascent. You leave at midnight to try to make it by dawn to see the sunrise over the roof of Africa. And you have to travel in the middle of the night because it's sub-zero temperature, and it's gravel for the last three to 500 yards, and the gravel is frozen, and you can get traction on it. If you go during the day, and it's warmed up, uh, you're slip sliding down the slope. On my final ascent, I kept thinking, for some reason, of my Aunt Alice, my mother's sister, Polish, Lombardi's Italian, but uh, my mother and her people were Polish. My Aunt Alice was as strong as an ox. I remembered seeing a picture of her when she was newly married, 
post-World War II, living with her husband who had emigrated from Poland, again after the war, they were living in Saskatchewan, Canada. She and her husband were wheat farmers. The snow was as high as the house in this picture. It was October of 1947, and the snow lasted till April. I figured if my Aunt Alice and her young husband, Uncle Stanislaus, could endure, so could I. Her blood was coursing through my veins. That mental image helped me to get to the top of that mountain. Being a part of or seeing yourself in your family narrative will help you to survive a lot of things. Now the best place for me to get up close and personal, down and dirty, this view of life that I wanted was medical school. Here I could poke and prod and be curious to my heart's content. I could stare at slides, at x-rays, at dissected limbs and broken bodies and not feel self-conscious. I could compete against a body of knowledge. If I could read five to seven pages per hour, how long would it take me to finish a 900-page textbook? Could I commit large sections to memory? Could I recall it when asked in a stressful setting? And I have to say, it was not just fun, it was exhilarating. I know, it makes me sound very odd, but it was exhilarating as there comes a joy with the total understanding and mastery of a topic. And it was thrilling because of the competition, not with other students, but with oneself. It helps you to define yourself, to get to know and understand yourself. Where do you fit in? What are you made of? And this you want to figure out at your stage of life. My dorm room at NYU Medical School overlooked the ambulance bay, the entrance to the emergency room. And my room was bathed all hours of the day and night in the sounds and lights of the ambulances coming in on their midnight run. I'd lie awake wondering what I was missing. My roommate was, my roommate was smarter than me and he worked harder. I'd want to knock it off at 9 p.m. and go downstairs and shoot pool. He'd say, let's give it another hour. And then at 10 o'clock, he'd say, let's give it an additional hour. I felt too guilty to leave, so I'd stay. He made me a better student. In our clinical work, we'd work 36 hours in a row. They don't allow it anymore. It's against the law but I wouldn't trade it for anything. It was my drug. I got to see, again, up close and personal, the natural progression of serious life-threatening illnesses. And to have been sent home after 12 or 24 hours, I would have felt like I was missing out the final half hour of a thriller movie or the fourth quarter of a close game. By the way, how did I pay for medical school? I won the Lou Rudin Scholarship. It paid my tuition, and I needed the dough. Lou was an old Jewish New York real estate guy. We never met. I think they pulled my name out of a hat. But for years, for years, I wrote him every year. I sent him a letter or a card thanking him. It was nothing heavy, just chit chat really. He wrote back once or twice, but it was mostly a one way conversation. Lou eventually died. I met his son Bill recently at a social function. I told him who I was and my pen pal relationship with his father. He said, that was you? He says, my father would ask me, who's this crazy kid? Why is he still writing me? What does he want from me? 
but he really enjoyed getting those letters from this kid he never met. Three quick points. Don't be afraid to work hard. It will help you figure out who you are, what you want, and where you fit in. You're making an investment in yourself. It's the best investment you'll ever make. If you fall a little short of your goals, so what? It's important to try. Hang out with the smartest people you can. Wherever I go, I look for the smartest people in the room. If I sense I'm the smartest guy, it makes me a little nervous. Try to seek out and find some mentors. They're out there. There are men and women who want to make an investment in your career, be it spiritual, emotional, or financial. If you're lucky enough to find one, be grateful. Send them a postcard. It's better than an email. After finishing my medical residency, I decided to be a doctor in Africa for a year. I wanted a change of pace. The very first day I arrived in my new posting, it's a small town south of Mombasa in Kenya, directly on the Indian Ocean. On a dare, I swam with three other people to a sandbar which seemed deceptively close. It was roughly a quarter of a mile away. I'm not a strong swimmer. I'm a city kid. I got caught on a riptide on the way back, was carried out into the open water. I lost sight of land. I floated in the Indian Ocean for six hours. It seemed almost comical. I just finished my residency, my first day on the job. I was happened upon by three German tourists in a fishing boat. I saw them and started shouting. They saw me and started shouting back. As we got closer to each other, they started yelling hi and waving. I yelled hi back. They started shouting hi, 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 over and over, and waving their arms quite frantically. I asked myself, how friendly can these guys be? <laughs> then they started pointing behind me like that and saying hi, hi. I still didn't know what they meant. Then one guy did this. Hi. <laughs> Hi is the German word for shark. <laughs> I was swimming in a school of sharks. I scrambled into the boat. What's the lesson? I think it's learn how to speak German. <laughs> I finished my infectious disease fellowship. I got back to New York. I was home unpacking on a Saturday afternoon when the phone rang and a woman that I did not know began to interrogate me. Are you Dr. Lombardi? Are you Dr. George Lombardi? Are you an infectious disease specialist? Are you an expert in tropical infections? Would you consider yourself to be an expert in viral hemorrhagic fevers? She paused to take a breath and I jumped in. Who are you? Why are you asking me these questions? She said she was the personal representative for a world figure and a Nobel laureate, someone who was suspected to have a viral hemorrhagic fever, she was calling to ask if I would consult on the case. I knew this had to be a joke. I had just moved to New York. I had a small office. I had no patience. The phone never rang. I would sit at my desk. I would stare at the phone, trying to will it to ring. The Verizon repairman that I had come out said, the phone is not ringing because no one is calling. <laughs> but she convinced me that she was legitimate. And I wound up flying to Calcutta the next day on the Concorde, New York to London, London to Delhi, Delhi to Calcutta, 24 hours to consult on Mother Teresa. I made a diagnosis that the other doctors had not yet considered, and I'm credited with saving her life. If you're interested, you can go and see my YouTube video, 
It runs about 18 minutes. She lived another eight years. She'd come to New York, and I'd see her either in the office or I would travel to the South Bronx. I'm tight with the nuns. <laughs> you want them on your side. Take home message. If the phone rings, answer it. Take the call and try in life to say yes as often as you can. Along those lines, 10 years ago, the phone was ringing in my office, which is now a little busier, on a Friday afternoon at 5 to 5. My secretary, God lover, was out the door. I have a Pavlovian response when the phone rings. Again, I tend to answer it. It was one of the writers who was a patient of mine from the TV show Law and Order. He was calling to tell me that Dick Wolf's dad was in the emergency room and there had been a miscommunication and this man's doctor was in fact not going to show up. Now Dick Wolf is one of the most successful people in television. The Law and Order series, Criminal Intent, Special Victim, Chicago Fire, Chicago Police, etc. The man's a legend. So I offered to go to the emergency room. I literally just walked across the street. I met the father. The diagnosis was clear. He had pneumonia, older man. I put him in the hospital for the weekend. Dick flew in the following Monday, and we passed. Our paths crossed outside the father's hospital room. He put out his hand and thanked me. I got to do my well-rehearsed, self-deprecatory, no, no problem, my pleasure, I'm a doctor. It's the only time I met him up to that point. Three months later, an executive from NBC, NBC Universal called me and wanted to hire me as a technical advisor for the television show. Dick had given him my name. I read all the scripts for Law and Order and for Law and Order Criminal Intent, uh, and that went on for seven years. I helped them with their story ideas, medical language, things a doctor might or might not say. I interacted with the writers, directors, and actors. I played a dead body in an opening scene. <laughs> the director said, George, when I say action, you hold your breath. <laughs> if you watch the credits on the reruns at the end of the show, you'll see my name. Just don't blink. They roll by pretty quickly. <laughs> Dick and I became good friends that's lasted to this day. I'm the godfather to his youngest child. Another message, when Hollywood calls, definitely answer the phone. <laughs> they pay well, and you get to go on private planes. I told you at the very beginning, I became a doctor to escape poverty and to escape boredom. My feeling and empathy for people grew as I got older. I was not mature enough at that young age to understand exactly what I was seeing. You watch people go through difficult times, and it cannot help but change you. Fanciful language, like the indomitability of the human spirit, or grace under pressure, become not just words, but things you see on a daily basis. What I have learned about courage, I have learned from my patients. Hey, Mother Teresa, Dick Wolf, Law and Order, the nuns, floating in the Indian Ocean, climbing Mount Kilimanjaro. How much fun can one guy have? For me, there's no other career, and there's no other career, be it finance or accounting or the law, that will give you the insight into the human condition like a healthcare career. Like a healthcare career. It's a very noble endeavor, and it will make you proud. And I'll stop here. Thank you. I feel most for students that are coming out with, uh, you know, huge debts and then have to go into a field that, uh, you know, I, I came out with a lot of latitude. 
I could do a little bit of this, a little bit of that. I did my internal medicine residency. I was a doctor in Africa for a year. I did three years of infectious diseases. I did one year of critical care. And I, part of that is because I didn't really know what I wanted to, where I wanted to end up. And I don't think I wanted to grow up. But I wouldn't have been able to do that if I had uh, you know, a big payment every month. So, but there are sources for funding, uh, and you have to be creative about it, and, um, and that's my main concern. I think if you, if you like it, if you, if you love what you're doing, uh, you know, you'll always find a way, but if there's going to be some way that you can keep that minimized, like I was speaking to some of the students today, and I don't know, what is it, like eight guys live in one room or something like that? Or, uh, all right, maybe it's not that bad. Uh, but they all share a house, and, um, and it's really kind of a way to do it. I want to take a mention here and introduce uh, Dr. Plasilova, who came down from Yale, New Haven. She graduated. Magda, stand up and just wave to... Magda came to this country from the Czech Republic, did her MD, PhD there. Did you have any loans? A little bit. And then she wanted to be a surgeon. And, uh, you know, it was a seven year journey for her to finish her general surgery residency. And now she's a uh, breast surgeon at Yale New Haven. Um, but she lived in three or four different towns. Uh, you have to travel, you have to be mobile, and if you're blogged down by either payments or... Fi the, the other thing about my parents, I tell you, I think I'm... Uh, I, I, I'm going to give you guys the wrong impression, but <laughs> my father did. He sat me down at the age of 11. You can just think, think of, you know, think of an 11-year-old kid. He said, come over here, we have to have a talk. I go, what is it, Dad? There's no family money. <laughs> I go, what? He goes, look, I, I just want you to know that there's no family money. There's just no, there's just no money here. So whatever you do in life, you're going to do on your own. And, you know, your mother and I will try to help you, and, you know, ba 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 ba. He, he wanted to get this off his chest. And then he said, all right, go play. He felt better. I was kind of burdened with this new anxiety. <laughs> I didn't really know what that meant. But to their credit, they uh, gave me license and liberty uh, to go wherever I thought was best for my education and for my training. They, they were not this kind of you know, immigrant family where I had to stay close to home, or I had to live next door, or I had to live around the block. They, they were, it was almost like, are you still here? Get, get out there, get on with it. And, um, and that was actually an advantage. I, did, I, didn't, have, I didn't have a lot of tethers, uh, so I could, I, could, I could be a free agent. Wash your hands. <laughs> Frequently and thoroughly. And I guess they just instituted, right? Yesterday, I think, uh, the, the states of New Jersey and New York, if you're a healthcare worker, you're coming back from West Africa, you are on isolation self-quarantine actually for three weeks. That's interesting. We'll see how that'll play out. But I, I would go. I, I, I think you can be, you know, there was a time, you know, Vincent and I were talking, there was a time you wouldn't want to walk around this neighborhood uh, after hours. Is the, am I safe here? Am I safe in this neighborhood now? Um, so that, you know, there's just so much news and so, min so much information, you know, and, you know, all you have to do is turn on a any cable channel and they run 24-7 and, and there's a certain amount, uh, and if they're honest about it, you know, if you'll meet TV reporters or journalists or you just kind of understand their business, you know, which is to keep ratings high, to keep people tuned in, you know, there's a certain fear mongering. Um, you know, they have to keep telling the story in the most, um, you know, gushy way, and you know, and it, everything seems very hyperventilated. You know, you watch some of these things, and it's like, oh my God! It's like, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm gonna, I'm climbing under the bed. I'm not, and I'm never leaving. You, you can't, 
fall victim to that. You know, what, what you have for you now is you have your youth and you have vitality. And uh, young people can put in 12, 14 hours, you know, they can, young people I find sleep, very, they can fall asleep on the desk and they wake up and then they're ready to go. And, and you have that going for you. And, you know, you're going to be smart. You know, you're New Yorkers, you know, you, you know to, you know, walk away from that kid with the crazy stare. You know, you're going to cross the subway platform or something. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't be put off by older people having these concerns for you, you know, that you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't, you shouldn't do anything. You know, you'd really, you know, you could, and then your life would become very, could become very, very circumscribed and very small. And, um, and it, you know, it doesn't, you know, you can travel, you can get cut rate airfares, you can live plainly. You know, and it's almost easier now because when you, you know, once you get out of the world and you start making a salary, then, then it's hard to go back because you don't want to give certain things up. But it's almost, you know, I, you know, growing up the way I did, you really didn't know a better way. I mean, this was kind of it. You know, my, my mother was one of, I like to tell the story, my mother again was Polish. She had nine sisters. There were ten girls in this family. They slept five to a bed in uh, rural Pennsylvania. And uh, my, my grandfather had a great line. He says, if I ever came home and found the toilet seat up, I knew I had a problem. <laughs> but you, you just, if you don't, and you don't have to think that you're, you know, not smart or you're, you know, you're not sophisticated. I saw a young woman yesterday. I was really very touched by her. She, came to my office with her mother, a new patient. She has uh, mild but definite signs of cerebral palsy. And you know, the way she walks and the way she speaks. You know, there was a birth injury 19 years ago. And she comes from a fairly well-to-do family in Mexico. And, uh, and, and she, she wanted to come to New York City. And she found her way. She applied and she got into the new school uh, and she came to New York City with a companion, with a woman who, uh, if you think about this, who basically walks with her to school. To pr so she doesn't, because she has had problems of falling in the street. So this woman has to kind of stand, you know, six feet behind her and watch her as she walks, helps her with her meals. Uh, and, and I said, how, you know, how was class? How was she says, you know, everybody, all my fellow students are so smart and they seem so sophisticated to me. They're all 18, 19 years old. And I said, you know what? It's a veneer. It's right at the surface. You know, New Yorkers, we can have kind of a pseudo sophistication, you know, but <laughs> you, it's really right. And I, and I said, don't be put off by any of that. And I said, your life story, what this woman has been through, you know, nine orthopedic surgeries, you know, counseling, therapy, occupational therapy. And for her to want to come to New York and sit around a table with 10 or 12 or 14 students in these seminars. And, and anyway, I thought it was really very courageous and, uh, and good for her. And her mother's sitting there like stricken, you know, like she's so nervous. And, but anyway. Well, that's what I meant a little bit. If you can, uh, you know, rather than think of yourself as a single, isolated individual, you know, like it, I, I really do. I, I have, uh, you know, the power of storytelling. If you can look back into your own family and, um, and identify uh, with, you know, and maybe this person isn't even alive. Maybe you can look through old photographs or you can talk to older relatives. If there's some way that you can take a certain amount of courage, um, you know, from, from people that have come before you. I mean, many have gone before us. You know, I, I, I grew up on these stories of you know, a month in the car with my father, that's a lot of time to, to you know, to hear stories. And, uh, and, you know, the stories about how they, you know, his family made it to America. And my father was actually a pretty interesting guy. He was a, um, he was a nightclub musician. He was a piano player. 
And in the 40s and 50s, he played, you know, in all the big bands and things like that. And, uh, and, then, and then the 60s came along, the advent of rock and roll. And, uh, you know, and the nightclub business died. It withered on the vine and it kind of went away. And, you know, he was probably in his early 50s then. And so he reinvented himself. He just became, <laughs> he went out and he switched from the nightclub piano. Um, he got an electric piano and then he got an accordion and then he became a club date musician. And, he'd, and I was the band boy. I went out. Fridays, Saturdays, Sundays to, you know, all these, I've been to every catering hall in the tri-state area. I've had more chicken dinners than I, than I care to remember. Um, but I spent a lot of time with my father and a lot of stories of daring do. So to address your question a little more specifically, you, you're going to have to look into, into your families, you're going to have to look into yourself a little bit, and you're going to have to have some courage. Now, in this country, if, if, if you don't make it, you, you, you don't, you know, if, if, if you don't make it the first time, you, you get a do-over. You get, you get to kind of, you get to kind of try again, and there's nothing wrong with that. And, th and those are actually some of the better stories and the more empathic stories. Um, Magda grew up in the Czech Republic. You know, she had one shot. You were either going to be, go to medical school, or you're not going to go to, it was, it was binary. And so she, you know, she made that leap. So look into yourselves, have courage, have faith, be not afraid. It, you know, what, what's kind of the worst thing that could happen to you in a sense? It's, you try, it doesn't work, you try again, you pick yourself up, that kind of thing. I don't know, does that help? Well, I was um, young, maybe foolish. You know, I graduated college at a young age. Um, again, I, I wouldn't, I, and I, 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 I didn't really have much in the way of options. I, I wasn't going to be a musician. I couldn't abide you know, business or accounting. Uh, in fact, I went, I was telling Vincent, I was actually in Chicago this week to speak at a, um, it's like a sideline for me. I'm now, I'm now, uh, I'm now a paid speaker. And uh, they flew me to, an accounting group, an accounting consulting group flew me to Chicago to tell a story that they thought was, um, you know, emblematic of the art of medicine. And uh, he says, you know, these are all healthcare accountants. They work for big HMOs and hospitals and things like that. Anyway, I, somebody went on before me. The schedule got turned around. So I was supposed to go first, but th an accounting executive went first. And I, and I tell you, I have never heard of any, I've seen or heard anything as boring as that. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I, I almost, I'm not even sure. I mean, it would have been very impolite to fall asleep. I mean, I was sitting in the front row ready to get on. I, I mean, to just start snoring out loud would have been. But there was something about it. And, you know, if, you're, if somebody, anyway, you know, each to their own. But that definitely wouldn't have been for me. I wanted, you know, I wanted to see stuff. I wanted to see. And, and, and the rougher it was, the better it was. I mean, I, I went into... You know, I trained at Bellevue Hospital. I spent, you know, I went to, I had two months at Harlem Hospital. I, you know, I, I just wanted to see it. I, I wanted to see how, what it could be like. And I, I, I would, you know, I, I didn't have a lot of friends. Um, I didn't have, as my own children want, who were your age, I might add, you know, you know Dad, I want a life. Huh, okay, <laughs> all right. I'm not really sure what that means, but, you know, friends and Facebook and things like that. You know, too many, too many distractions, too many things to kind of, and, and even to this day, I don't have a lot of friends. You know, I, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a guy with like two or three people that I would speak to on a regular, I know a lot of people, but friends can kind of take, you're going to find in your 20s, your friends are going to go all off in all kinds of different directions. And, uh, and some, of them gonna, some of them are going to be good for you, and some of them are going to not be so good. 
I would, uh, I know this sounds, I know it sounds Spartan. I'm going to get, get you guys ready for a Spartan way of life. I'd limit the friends. I'd keep, I'd stay low to the ground. I'd keep your costs low. Uh, I'd learn to eat standing up. I'd learn to sleep standing up. And, uh, but you're going to come out of it with something that's yours because uh, a training, uh, a skill, you know, they really, they really can't take away from you. I'm going to tell a Magdalena story because she won't, I couldn't get her to come up here and tell it. So, so she was in Winston-Salem at Wake Forest as a surgical resident and she would call me and she would complain about uh, you know, the amount of trauma cases they had and, you know, you know, I think there were 18 in one day, you know, shootings and stabbings and hangings and car wrecks and, and, and all kinds of nastiness and, you know, surgeons have to jump in and, and leap in and she's always covered in blood and, and, and just the pathos of that and, and, and what, what you, and so anyway, it gets to a person after a while. Then, uh, she moved to uh, Danbury, Connecticut, and she was finishing her general surgery there. And so roll, rolling into the ER one Saturday night when she was on call, comes a guy who was in a motorcycle crash, and he is impaled on the handlebar. The handlebar is through his chest wall, and the fire department had I guess welded off or sawn off. He came in with the handlebar sticking out of his chest and they roll him into the emergency room. And you know, the medical doctors, you know, that she likes to make fun of, you know, they're like running around, you know, they're like hysterical and everything like that. You know, they'd never seen anything like this before. And he, they hooked him up to the monitor and everything, IVs and everything. And the guy's talking, you know, he's talking with this handlebar sticking out of his chest. And, um, and then he rolled his eyes back and he went flatline. He, his heart stopped and he was dying right there on the table. And the internal medicine doctors and the ER doc are running around, you know, like Chicken Little. <laughs> Vincent's a surgeon. He, he, can, he loves these stories too. So Magda says to the guy, the attending, because she's a resident, she says, we have to open his chest up. Guy says, I've never done that before. She says, I did it all the time in, in, in Wake Forest. You know, give me, give, me the tr give me the chest tray, whatever it's called. Really? Or should we do that? Sh she goes, the guys, you know, we have four minutes here. Sure enough, right there, right out of the movies, opens the guy's chest up, takes out, well, I don't know, he takes out the handle, but had a hole in his heart. Gave it a couple of, meanwhile, I guess Carrie Passick came racing in. <laughs> The cardiothoracic surgeon, you know, the, the, you know the, the cardiothoracic surgeons are home, sleeping in their own beds, I might add. And anyway, they came racing in, saved this guy's life. Guy walked out of the hospital. 